really pleased we are that he, um, first of all, wrote to Chris saying he would like to talk to us at some point, and secondly, I invited him to come and talk here. He saw the prospectus and was interested, and I think we're all actually delighted that he's joined us here for the last three or four days. And so, over to you, Hans. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, as we know, you write here on, on domestic culture, on the Open Air Museum in Holland, the National Open Air Museum. And I would like to start with a few pictures to show you the world I stepped out of when coming here. <laughs> we, are, uh, we are not static open air museum like all farmhouses. And, and um, we are a very dynamic, very large open air museum. And with dynamic, I mean we are not stuck in the past, but we all, everything we do is, uh, uh, starts in the present. We look at this current society and what is uh, going on in the current society, and from that we approach history or uh, um, life, uh, or uh, deal with aspects. And um, we, we are uh, founded in 1912. We have been uh, collected material over a hundred years. Uh, we have 220,000 objects, um, 230 people working for us, uh, paid, and 450 volunteers. And we have about 82 buildings on our terrain. Um, recently, we were asked by the government not only to present the, the more agricultural side of our society, but also the big history. So here you see a part of the presentation with 50 windows on the Dutch history. It's just a part of the presentation. And one of the, that was one of the bigger projects um, in, in, the, in the past few years. Uh, one, the, the biggest pro project that we are dealing now with, we are building a new storage facility for our collection. And it's a few football fields big. <laughs> and uh, we will be there with the collection of the Rijks Museum, together with the collection of the Rijks Museum. And for that, the uh, entire collection is uh, photographed. It's one of our photographers first trying to get this uh, wagon into view, in the, in the view of the camera. Um, so everything is photographed in exactly the same way, with exactly the same quality. Uh, every object that has damage is, is treated, uh, preserved. And um, all the objects receive protective wrapping or asset-free boxes for the future storage. These are, uh, this is part of our um, tablecloths and uh, carpets. And um, <laughs> wow. while, while doing so, we made a few discoveries and uh, I wrote them down here. We found back objects we thought we had lost. We found objects we did not know we had. <laughs> Objects we always thought we had and couldn't find anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and objects we thought we had, we had the session long ago were discovered to be still in our stories. <laughs> <laughs> and everything in between. <laughs> but apart from that, we found 225 leatherback chairs. And they looked quite the same to us. Many of them looked quite the same. William brought a nice chair. And the backside is Dutch, in my opinion. And um, these knobs and these, the styles, the back legs, the, the, the little bun feet, and the um, top rail like this, it's typically Dutch. The rest, to my opinion, is not, but we will discuss this later. <laughs> then, at least if I turn it around this way, you have the first impression of a Dutch leather bag, yeah. 
And so we found 225 of these stairs. Nobody had, had ever had a serious look at them. And we asked ourselves, so do we need 225 <laughs> stairs that look rather similar? Um, can we date them? Is, are there any dateable features on these chairs? Uh, is there something like uh, regional differences? Um, so we started the WASH project. We studied the wood species. We started uh, study the construction, the tool traces, the stains and the paint layers, the models, uh, and the wear and tear on these chairs. It's, it's chairs. I can't go into all these details, what I will tell today is the history of the Leatherback chair in, in Holland. And for that, we not only studied a lot of Leatherback chairs, but we also studied about 5,000 paintings and engravings on which Leatherback chairs can be found. First of all, I'd like to show you some of the ancestors of uh, the Dutch Leatherback chair. The three most common ancestors of the Dutch leatherback chairs you see here. It's a, a, a chair with um, legs of a, quite a thick diameter, like the three-legged chair that we saw today in uh, what was it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and a, a, a lot of times the sides are closed. You see, this is one. So here you already see. The, the, the turn front back, turn back, back legs, I mean, the, the backward the turning, as you will see later. What type of one? Mm -hmm. Another chair, oh, sorry, what is this? Yeah, sorry, this is all, all right. Um, this is, uh, on the left you will see a, a chair like that, that was excavated uh, north of Rotterdam, and it is uh, in the 13th century, and the re reconstruction you see on the right is um, uh, ash, and um, this is our only medieval um, ancestor of the leatherback chair that still survived. And the other type is uh, a little chair that you will see there in the middle, and um, it's made of split wood, uh, riveted wood, riveted. Riven. 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 Riven wood uh, with uh, already a, a rush sheet and we have one in the collection. All the other chairs I'm going to show you today are from our collection, only the excavated chair is not in our collection. Um, so this is a chair like that. With, with ribbon uh, from ribbon wood with uh, a rush sheet that you see is of course not original and this is a, a bit later but um, comparable. The third and last um, ancestor of the Dutch leatherback chair is the three-legged chair and there is no uh, uh, copy, no, no, uh, no three-legged chair has survived in, in Holland. This is a, a reproduction of a later model. So these are the three chairs. Um, and going through these um, 5,000 pictures, I came across eight um, chairs that are contemporary to the Dutch leatherback chair, and I've dr made drawings of them in the Golden Age. So we talk about 1560 till 1660. In the Golden Age, there were eight chairs contemporary to each other. They were used at the same time. Still, the three-legged chair on the top left was used extensively, although it already occurs in the medieval times. It was still in use. And then you have the extended version with the uh, higher back that was in use during the Golden Age. Um, the um, the simple type of the three-legged chair that we saw today and the more decorated version uh, which you can uh, often see on paintings by Jan Steen. The other four you can see here 
uh, are often made with a um, strip of bent wood as a back support and uh, the top left is, is uh, the drawing from an existing uh, the chair and um, it's uh, 17th century to my knowledge and um, the last chair is already remarkably similar to the leatherback chair as we know today except that the armrests are stretchers and not really armrests like we uh, like it's underneath here. And um, there are paintings with chairs like that. This is a children's chair and it has armrests uh, as stretches as armrests. We have one in the collection over there, although that's a, that's a later, uh, a later uh, chair. This is a painting from early 17th century. I think this is a chair from 1870, 1880 actually. One of the earliest drawings that uh, portray uh, an, uh, a leatherback chair as we know today is this drawing. A, lady, a rich lady making lace work. Um, and um, the other engraving is a, a very rich family uh, around the dining table. The two children have to stand, they are not allowed to sit. It was a common Dutch practice to show their parents respect. Yeah. And there you see the um, the leatherback chair as it will continue to be used throughout the 17th century with uh, decorative turning uh, on the back styles and with uh, elaborate finials on top. And we have one chair like that in the collection. It's a doll's chair. And um, I don't think it's early, but I do think it's 17th century. And I even think that the um, mat you see here is the webbing or the mat, how you call it? It's original <laughs> because we did, we um, researched the uh, paint on this chair, and the oldest layer of paint is overlapping the um, the rushes uh, at the corners here and here. You can see black paint, which, and the, the same black paint is the, the first layer on these uh, uh, chairs. Mm, but no uh, adult uh, copies have survived. I don't know how you call this, uh, but only uh, in uh, only dolls or children's chairs have survived in this, in, from this age. So the. Um, Leatherback chair is slowly gaining terrain, is slowly becoming more fashionable in cities among rich people. Of, you see an example here. You can tell from the uh, furniture that they are quite well inlaid with ebony, and uh, we call it a daffodil chair, which are quite uh, expensive uh, chairs. Not only can we find evidence for the use of the leatherback chair during the 17th century, but we can also find new, uh, evidence that they were actually made in large cities. These are two um, gilt coins or gilt medals, we call them. And uh, this, these are the gilt medals of, from the city of Rotterdam. Uh, mid 17th century, uh, the St. Joseph Guild, and among the members of the St. Joseph Guild there were quite a few uh, chair turners, and here you see the um, leatherback chair with stretchers. Um, not only paintings, not only gilt medals, but also archival evidence we found. This is a chair made from Amsterdam. 1555, and he is uh, summing up 
in his um, inventory and in the front of his house and in the, the backyard, it says of the plaats on top. He, um, I have translated for you. He has a thousand pieces of ash wood, many chairs. He also makes axe handle. And um, he has two layers. So this man in the city of Amsterdam, 1650, is making a lot of turned, simple wooden chairs. Now I'm coming to the uh, phenomenon of green chairs. William found, or, or your, your friend found, a, a source of Boston. Maybe you can tell one or two lines about the Boston book, Harvard. Uh, yeah, um, the, um, <coughs> you know that I do a lot of research into Lincolnshire Rush City chairs, and recently we came across the Boston Port Records book, which has the the taxes paid on import through Boston, and Boston was a huge port in those days, and this book goes from about 1600 to 1640, and there are so many references to importation of Dutch green chairs, and it gives a tax on them as well, and from the tax you can work out the value of each chair, and each chair we worked out was six and a half P each. But they were coming into Boston by the hundreds, and they were called Dutch green chairs. Now the, the Dutch green chair already exists in medieval times because you can see them on paintings. The three-legged chair was already painted green. Uh, you can see them on paintings of the Hovel, for instance. Um, and here you see one of the many examples of a, a 17th century leatherback chair. Again, the turning, halfway the style, the decorative turning, and the de uh, elaborate finials on top. And um, there was, there were, in every city, there were, I use the Dutch expression, stool coolers. That's what literally translated it means chair greeners. And those were um, often painters that uh, <coughs> painted the chairs green. And um, they were used all over Holland. And, and your source shows that they were also exported to, uh, to England. Yeah. But it's a very common phenomenon. Um, the other uh, color often used is red. And uh, now and then you find we have one example. This, the, uh, the spray thing on the side is not my work. It's, uh, um, we have one example in our collection. And the, the first layer on this chair is greenish, but it's not an opaque. Uh, layer of paint. It's rather transparent. It's uh, very res resonance. Resonance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from well, of resonance. So it's it's more like a luster than than, than it's a, a, a paint. It's the only one we have. A, a really uh, early green chair. Now there were other decorations, but they are quite rare. Here you see um, a painting by. Uh, a female painter, Judith Leister, is in Stockholm, Sweden. And you see the damage here, I haven't noticed it. So. And you see a, a, a little decorative stamping on the, uh, the deck style. And there are other examples where they have marble style but under the chair. But apart from that, chairs were green or they were um, waxed transparently and nothing else. Now, if we leave the um, 17th century, we have a look in the 18th century, then we will find that in the cities, the leatherback chair has become a very common chair used by a much poorer and wider, uh, a larger audience. And um, you can see that here. We are in the month of May, a month in Holland where uh, people are allowed to uh, change from uh, employer, so they could think and stop with one employer and go to the next employer. And here, uh, on the front, you see a family moving from one uh, master's household to the other, and they have leatherback chairs on top of their belongings. And in the back, 
you see their employer um, leaving, I think, the house to um, go to their manor house on the countryside. Because the aristocracy in Amsterdam used to leave Amsterdam in spring because the canals were starting to stink tremendously because uh, the, uh, the feces were just dumped in all these canals. So they fled during the summer and you, we don't see any um, leatherbacks yet, but we see uh, cabriole, French-inspired chairs, you see a tea table. So the, the, um, among the rich, the leatherback chair was getting out of fashion during the 18th century and was widely used among poor people. That's also illustrated here. Pancake baker, earning her money uh, with baking pancakes. People come in with money to uh, buy some pancakes and you see her sitting on a uh, leatherback chair with very comparable hands as uh, the chair you see here. And a tea table. Next lecture. Next talk I will do on tea tables, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> because I've already found tea tables in medieval times. Oh. Yeah. They wouldn't have drunk tea yet <laughs> on these tables. <laughs> the, um, this table stone shows us that uh, the um, leather chair was a very normal uh, phenomenon. It says nooit volmaakt. It means never perfect. Never perfect. Uh, mean, the, the Gable Stone wants to tell us we, we have this and now we have to have these gilded, gilded uh, rich furniture and still we're not satisfied. Okay. So they have left behind the, the leatherback already. What the leatherback is, is getting more, um, is gaining more terrain <laughs> on the countryside. Here we see a, uh, a farmer's interior, the big kitchen. And then we see two things. We still see the three legged chair. The lady is sitting on the lady of the house is sitting on a three legged chair. And we are in 1760. Still in use. Um, but the decorative sh uh, shape, the decorative form, so the 17th century form. And her child is tied to a uh, children's chair. It's a very common way to raise children in Hull, just tie them to their chairs. So <laughs> we go anywhere. And if you look close, closely to this chair, then um, it has a hollow top rail. And I found mm. quite some chairs that have hollow top rails. And I, I don't know why. <laughs> Maybe you can tell me. But uh, usually, of course, if you, if you grab a chair, this, this part might snap off, but it, it snaps off straight with the grain. It doesn't snap off, off with the curve. And uh, we found quite some chairs, and you also see this on this painting, with a curved top rail. I don't know why. Anyway, oh, yeah. this is an example. Well, that's not the best example, but this, this is an example. Of such a chair. Mm -hmm. So we are um, during the 19th century. You see that the leatherback chair is still in use <laughs> among the poorer people. This is a fisher, a fisher village on the Isle of Marken, and um, they use a lot of mahogany stained, um, usually elmwood um, leatherback chairs. Uh, comparable to a chair like that. You see, the, um, I've, the, the reason why I think this half is English and this half is Dutch is in, in Holland or in normal paintings I've ever seen a chair with these decorative stretches and this baluster like turning on this side. So, I don't know, I've seen this chair on here yesterday, but it made me think about the uh, Boston 
both in the town and that maybe the Dutch at some time have made leatherback chairs um, for the English market and um, that this is a chair made in Holland but uh, with a more or less English feel to it. Um, we extensively studied the wear and tear on these chairs, and um, you will always find that uh, in front, especially when you have a lower structure here, it is worn out by the feet that people put up. But uh, sometimes we find chairs that show the same kind of wear on the back structures. You are looking at the back of the chair now, the back side of the chair, and the um, the back stretches are hollowed out, as you can see there, especially. And um, it kept me wondering for quite a while how on earth you are able to put your feet on the back stretches. <laughs> so what would you have to do? Um, but then it correlates with um, top rails that have a number on them. Um, so it must have been chairs from public places. And then I found this picture. Um, in a church, people <laughs> sitting in rows, and they would put their feet on the stretcher yeah. of the chair in front of them. So wearing out the back stretchers instead of the front stretchers that you will find in a household. <laughs> The um, other kind of operation that kept me puzzled for quite a while is this type. You, you see that the, the back of the um, chair on, of the back legs is abraded all along the um, length. And even the uh, rails are um, sanded almost. I couldn't figure out what that could be. Till I found this picture of children. Oh. <laughs> 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 Evidently, their, their parents are away from home. <laughs> and this is what children do with your furniture <laughs> when you're not there. <laughs> anyway, um, around 1900, the um, leatherback chair was only used in a few pockets in Holland. And um, here you see a beautiful example of a, uh, a farmer's family with the uh, maidens and the knecht, uh, as we call it, I don't know what the English name is, um, processing linen in all that many places. And then, at the moment that the just another bit of chair was only used in a few pockets. It was discovered by designers. <laughs> and they um, interpreted the fact that it was only used at their time during their life in those pockets. And they interpreted it as being regional. They thought, ah, this chair is regional. And um, they thought it was a real farmer chair. And it, it, it uh, reflected the the noble simplicity of the farmer, farmer's life, farmer's spirits, and they started to um, promote this type of chair and, and enhance it, even simplify it a little more to uh, have it look like more farm-like, more. And here you see examples. Um, so top-notch designers uh, creating top-notch. Uh, leatherback chairs for the richer people um, and, and much more simple. <coughs> we have a few of those in the collection. Um, but what really happens here is that the designers um, interpret these pockets as being that the leatherback chair is regional while actually it was a, 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 a 
countrywide phenomenon. And um, they interpret it as being typically for the noble farmer, whereas originally the leatherback chair comes from the elite, the city elite, around 1600 in, uh, in Holland. And if you would ask the farmers at that time what they would have liked, they would have um, associated this type of chair with poverty, not with um, design or anything desirable. The type of leatherback chair that they would have fancied is this one. Ornate, lots of decoration. And this is what the, the farmers really bought around 1920, 1930. Yeah. Um, to, to finish it all, I'm going to show a film. Our museum has um, put up on my glasses. In 1964, our museum has uh, made a documentary on the last leatherback chair maker of Eindhoven Holland. Uh, and um, by then, he, he, had, he, he wasn't producing any leatherback chairs anymore, but um, he shows us for the last time how he did it during, just before and just after the First World War. And he's using the tools of his father. Let's see if we can get it working again. It's in Dutch, but you will understand most of it. This is the wood for the stretchers. 